Hey kids, do you like Jack the Ripper? Have you ever just wanted him to live out your little sister's homoerotic Tumblr fan fiction just <laughs> and just have him pin your twink ass to the wall at night and then show you that sweet, sweet man cheese he's got hiding under his sleeves? Well, you're in luck, because today we're going to be talking about the downright wild story of an even sexier little beef grinder, Jack the Stripper. And no, this isn't the name of some cheesy male live stro on the Vegas Strip for a generation that hasn't discovered Pornhub yet. But trust me, this show is just as lively and explosive as any $50 could get you in the degenerate capital of the Americas, because this was the actual name of one of those sweet sexy hunks who roamed the London streets at night. So it all starts in 20th century England, back when people were still getting jitty in the ginnels, if you can catch what I'm pitching. Because if there is one thing that 1900s London loved more than chronic alcoholism and child labor, it was underage poverty girls. Because everyone knows that the safest and most profitable job was to be a nude slag in the old smoke. Now at this point in time, prostitution was actually the fourth largest female occupation in London. And renting gravy holes was such a popular occupation that a whopping one in three sick cases in the British military was from... You guessed it, good old slapping titties daily. And one day, in this wonderful renaissance of social decay in the UK, the bodies of prostitutes just started piling up. All of them either strangled or drowned, and all in the same general area from June of 1959 to February of 1965, with the first body being found on the River Thames in a lover's lane known as... Um... <laughs> FREEDOM! But anyways, all were stripped at least partially naked, and many strangely showed no signs of struggle, but were missing some of their teeth or had weird specks of paint on their bodies, with one of the lead detectives speculating that, I'm not even joking here, that the women had been choked to death while slobbing on the killer's dick. Now talk about playing to the killer's ego. And at first, a few good time girls turning brown bread didn't raise any police eyebrows, but after a good five of them could no longer offer their services to them, the police then finally sent out a warning to all call girls to beware of yet another madman hellbent on piling up his body count, to which two prostitutes, Francis Brown and Kim Taylor, just continued about their daily lives. Shagging and bagging, joking and joshing with each other about how they were going to be the killer's next victims. Dumb fucks. But luckily, it was only Frances Brown that got escorted that day, and Kim Taylor actually got to see the man she was taking a ride with, and from her description came this sketch of the excitable gentleman, which unsurprisingly, got the case absolutely nowhere. And come one more, quick body later, the police still had no good leads. And as far as the heavies could tell, all of these dames probably spent their time appearing in pornographic movies, and were probably part of the underground London party scene too. And wait, you might just be thinking to yourself, Hey Samuel, just what in the fryer tuck did all of that rumpy pumpy look like in the 50s? And boy am I glad you asked. Because one of the murder victims, Hannah Tailford, was known for giving the inside scoop, one time claiming that in one of her many lavish sex adventures, she was once picked up by a limousine and brought to an aristocrat's house where she played an aggressive game of how's your father with a horny bloke in a gorilla costume, all in front of a large crowd of people who aggressively cheered them on. Man, they just don't make parties like they used to. But anyways, after all was said and done, this mystery killer had torn up at least a good six fanny bumblers, and this caused Scotland Yard to go into a frenzy. And I know, I know very well that Scotland Yard has nothing to do with Scotland, but I really want to make some Scottish slander here. I'm the, I'm the fucking daddy! So from now on in this video, they will be. But anyways, they ended up going crazy with the Ks, calling up every single cadet, detective, and female police officer with the latter going undercover themselves as prostitutes to help find the Jack of Jumps, a truly brave act which I'm sure isn't going to inspire a degenerate in the far corners of the internet somewhere. And together, they all ended up knocking on every single door in West London looking for evidence, but never really found any, with this actually being the biggest case of its kind ever up in London, to the point where Chief Superintendent John Dew Rose, who was the lead detective on this case, ended up interviewing almost 7,000 suspects by the end of the case, but still to no avail. But soon after the last murder, a breakthrough finally came in, when it was found that the specks of paint that were mysteriously lining the girls' bodies perfectly matched up with those being left on a nearby building by a local paint spraying shop, and seeing yet another opportunity to use his mouth, 
Detective John Duro suddenly got the blower to the papers and held a big news conference, where he did some typical big talk and falsely rabbited on about how the once enormous suspect pool had just been narrowed down to 20. And then soon after, he went back up to the podium and announced that it was narrowed down to 10. And then he went back up to the podium again and then announced that it had been narrowed down to as little as even three before that one news conference was over. And rather suspiciously, no more stripper cases were found from that day on. And funny enough, London started to crack down on prostitution at around the same time, which I'm sure this case had no bearing on. So then, with all that said and done, you might be wondering, just who did it? Well, according to lead detective Du Rose, it was a man named Mungo Ireland, a 40-year-old security guard who, after the big showy press conference, ended up gassing himself in his garage with a suicide note that read, quote, It may be my fault, but not all of it. P.S. To save you and the police looking for me, I'll be in the garage. Seems pretty conclusive, right? Well, it turns out, Mungo was probably talking to his wife about their marital struggles in that letter. And he was actually due in court the morning he was found dead for a minor motoring offense. And he knew that the police would come looking for him when he inevitably skipped duty that morning. And worse yet, according to crime author David Seabrook, who had unprecedented access to the original police files, lead detective John Du Rose was crooked as a bent fender and pinned the murder on a barely applicable suicide victim so that he could retire the very next year on a high I note, and that another senior detective working on the case, Detective Superintendent Bill Boddock, heavily disagreed with Du Rose's findings and deeply resented him for going public with his claims, instead favoring a much closer, more sinister suspect. According to Seabrook, this mysterious unnamed suspect was a former police officer who was kicked out of the force at around the same time the murders went on. He was a spiteful man who started committing petty burglaries to get back at Scotland Yard, who had accused him of being corrupt when he was a cop. And it turns out, almost everybody was dumped in the exact border of a different police subdivision, a boundary very few outside of the police would actually know. And sometimes, the bodies were dumped either in a heavily patrolled area, a suspiciously risky place to dump a body, or in the case of the last victim, Bridie O'Hara, right next to the paint sprayer that the police had been desperately searching for. Even to John Du Rose, this seemed way too deliberate to be a coincidence. And even he really believed that the serial killer was reading the news reports and adjusting his dumping grounds to taunt them. Although, if I'm to be honest here, the evidence could really go either way if you get into the nitty gritties. So, I'd really love to see you guys discuss it down in the comments section. And thus, the mystery of Jack the Stripper lives on to this day. So kids, I think the moral of the story here is... Don't be a hooker in 20th century London. Hell, don't be a hooker at all. I mean, there are better ways to earn five quid than to give a handy to some lame toff behind a dumpster who hasn't got the chirps that he is used to. But anyways, I'm Samuel Drella, and boy, I could use a fat toddy on me knob.